The election recounts have finally halted and Democrats have reluctantly reconceded but swear to fight another day. Meanwhile, in Europe, bureaucrats trample the will of the people and try to kill Brexit. We will analyze undemocratic liberalism and illiberal democracy. Then, young people stop having sex, a homeless bum scams America, and Google has an anti-labor labor movement on its hands. I'm Michael Knowles and this is The Michael Knowles Show. Huzzah, the impossible has happened. Democrats have conceded an election in Florida. We didn't think it was possible. It hasn't happened for 15 or 20 or 50,000 years, but Democrats have done it. Andrew Gillum, uh, the Democrat running for governor, has finally reconceded. And uh, Bill Nelson, the senator or Democrat from Florida, has conceded to Rick Scott. We will analyze what it means and why and how the left, not just in the U.S., but broadly, is trying to undermine both liberalism and democracy. But first, let's make a little money, honey. That's very important to economic freedom. Uh, Robinhood is an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, and cryptos, all commission free. It's simple and intuitive, clear design with data presented in an easy to digest way. Learn more at Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S dot Robinhood dot com. This is a really important because a lot of services that will help you invest, they cost money, there are some commission fees, other brokerages can charge up to 10 bucks for every trade. Robinhood doesn't charge commission at all. Trade the stocks and keep all of your profits. It's why it's so, so good. It's really easy to use, easy to understand charts, market data. You can place a trade in just four taps on your smartphone. I won't do anything that requires more than five taps. That just, uh, that tires me out too much. I'm too millennial for that. Uh, Robinhood is, also lets you view stock collections like the 100 most popular sectors like entertainment, social media curated categories and analyst ratings of buy, hold, sell for every single stock. You learn it by doing. You learn how to invest as you build your portfolio. You can discover new stocks and track your favorite companies with personalized news feed, uh, custom notifications for price movements. You never miss the right moment to invest. Right now, Robinhood is giving listeners a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help build your portfolio. Now imagine if you sold up for Robinhood, if you signed up in the early 1990s and you got a free piece of Apple stock, you'd be retiring right now. You'd be on a beach somewhere, sipping a Mai Tai, listening to this show. So go do it. You're getting a free stock. Knowles.Robinhood.com. Knowles.Robinhood.com. Sign up right now. Okay. The impossible. What a great day. What a wonderful celebration. Democrats have conceded races. Ron DeSantis, the Republican, has officially beaten Andrew Gillum. He is now the governor of Florida or governor-elect of Florida. He won this race by 34,000 votes. That's out of 8 million votes cast. So he won it by 0.41%. Um, Andrew Gillum was holding out. He was hoping that all of those fraudulent Democrat votes that were pouring in were going to bring that number down to 0.25%, at which point that would have triggered under Florida law a manual hand recount, an automatic, rather, hand recount. So he was really hoping for that. There was rampant corruption going on in this case. Uh, There were provisional ballots being discovered days after the election. Democrat activists were backing up truckloads full of ballots into election headquarters. It was a total farce. Brenda Snipes, who's the election supervisor of Broward County, it looks like she's going to be forced to resign now. And this is true also in the Senate race. So uh, Andrew Gillum, in, in the governor's race, he finally conceded, he tweeted out, I want to congratulate Ron DeSantis on becoming the next governor of the great state of Florida. My wife, RJ, R period, J-A-I, I, I didn't, I, that's interesting, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and I could not be prouder of the way we ran this race. We could not be more thankful to my running mate, Chris King, and his wife, uh, Kristen. Okay, so he congratulates him. That's good. I was, had a little trepidation here when I read this because uh, Andrew Gillum has conceded this race before and then he unconceded it because he realized that he could try to steal the election, but unfortunately it didn't work out for them. So he, uh, he goes on. He says, we are going to keep fighting. We will keep working. And in the end, I believe that we will win. I'm so thankful to each and every one of you. So what does that mean? It sounds like the sort of thing when you lose a race, you say, we're going to keep fighting. He's saying, I'm, I'm going to, I believe that we will win. Now, that's what he said after the election, because he kept inventing all of these new votes that were coming in and in and in. But this is the typical Democrat move. 
It is the perpetual campaign. The campaign is never over. Loss doesn't matter. Loss is only a temporary setback because the wheels of history are moving. They are progressing inevitably toward the future, toward utopia. And Bill Buckley, when he started the National Review, the conservative flagship newspaper at that time, a magazine rather, said that a conservative is one who stands athwart history yelling stop. So the left, the Democrat Party, they're saying that we're going to keep fighting, we're going to win, this is, this is barely even a loss, we're going to win, we're going to barrel through, we're going to win, and the conservative says, stop. This is not just true in America, it's true in Britain as well, as we're going to see. Uh, the other race in Florida is Rick Scott beating out Bill Nelson. And Bill Nelson, I think, has served three terms in the Senate, long-standing Democrat senator. Rick Scott beat him by, at last count, 10,000 votes. So this was after it triggered a machine recount, it triggered a manual recount, but as many provisional ballots and fake fraudulent ballots and illegal ballots uh, as they could count, it, they still couldn't come up with that last 10,000. So Bill Nelson finally conceded. Here's Nelson's concession address. Well, things worked out a little differently than Grace and I had hoped, but let me say I by no measure feel defeated and that's because I've had the privilege of serving the people of Florida and our country for most of my life. And I don't think anybody could have been as blessed. It's been a rewarding journey as well as a very humbling experience. I was not victorious in this race, but I still wish to strongly reaffirm the cause for which we fought. A public office is a public trust. Is that what happens when you serve in the Senate for three terms? Do you inevitably become that guy? That guy who, uh, does he have any human left in him? He's just a good old politician. And I'm going to force that smile even though I want to murder about half of the constituents in my state. But I will like to congratulate, and his face just morphs into, he's just a purely plastic politician. It's amazing he got as far as he did, especially, you know, Rick Scott is a pretty good, he was a pretty good governor, he's a pretty good candidate, um, but he's out. Bill Nelson is finally out. I'm very glad that takes care of Florida. Then you move up to Georgia. George is the ridiculous one. I actually understand why the Democrats held out in Florida because one, it's extraordinarily corrupt and two, these were close votes. Even before all these fraudulent, ridiculous days later recounts, new ballots coming in, uh, it was a very close vote. Florida is known for close votes. And then when you add these corrupt officials like Brenda Snipes in there, they probably thought maybe we can squeak it by, maybe we can steal this election. That's fine. People have been stealing elections in America for as long as the country has existed, especially Democrats because they're very good at it. So I kind of understand it there. The one that is puzzling is Stacey Abrams. Stacey Abrams was running against Brian Kemp to be the governor of Georgia, the Republican Brian Kemp one, he didn't win by 10,000 votes. He didn't win by 30,000 votes. He won by 55,000 votes. He won by 1.4%. That is not that close. You know, you see that automatic recounts are triggered at 0.25%, maybe 0.5%. This is 1.4%. It's three times the number that triggers an automatic recount in Florida. And so he wins by a fair bit. This Stacey Abrams, total sore loser, awful candidate, boasted about how illegal aliens are part of her co voter coalition. <laughs> not a good idea for future candidates who are taking notes right now. Don't do that. That's not, that doesn't play well with voters. So she uh, constantly was trying to drag this thing out. She wouldn't concede. She's still barely conceding. Here is Stacey Abrams talking to Jake Tapper after it's all but been admitted around the country that the Republican Brian Kemp beat her. Do you think that Brian Kemp is not the legitimate governor-elect of Georgia. The law as it stands says that he received an adequate number of votes to become the governor of Georgia. And I acknowledge the law as it stands. I am a lawyer by training, and I am someone who's taken a constitutional oath to uphold the law. But we know sometimes the law does not do what it should, and that something being legal does not make it right. This is someone who has compromised our systems. He's compromised our democratic systems and that is not appropriate. And therefore, my mission is going to be to make certain no one else has to face this conversation. The law as it stands. Listen to what she's saying. Read between the lines here. She's saying, well, yes, according to the law, the person who wins the most votes becomes the governor. Yeah, that's according to the law. 
but sometimes the law gets it wrong, meaning the people got it wrong, meaning that the person who gets the most votes should not become the governor, that there should be some new election, a runoff election, another recount. We're going to discover new ballots somewhere. She is saying, she says, look, I'm a lawyer. I guess she's a lawyer. She's pretty, certainly pretty slippery. She's got some of the traits of lawyers stereotypically. But what she is arguing against is the ability of Georgians to choose their governor. She says, yeah, I guess technically according to the law, he won the election, but I don't think he should have won the election. And therefore she's suggesting that he stole it. I mean, that's the quote, that, that an Abrams loss in Georgia is that, uh, uh, this is the suggestion among Democrats, that he stole the election, it was illegitimate, it was unfair, it wasn't. He won the election. He didn't win it by a little couple thousand votes or 10,000 votes. He won it by a good margin. But they won't even concede that because to them, to progressives, any time a conservative wins, that is illegitimate. Why is it illegitimate? Because there's progress. There's progress to be made. That's why we're progressives, isn't it? There's a utopia at the end. We're going to get to it. And if you stand in the way of progress, if you stand athwart history yelling stop, then you must be either stupid or evil. You must be so stupid you can't see the progress in front of you, or you've got to be evil. You want to stop people from uh, living in this paradise that the Democrats are going to give you if you just give them a little bit more money and a little bit more power. That's what she means. That's what all of these Democrats mean when they say it's illegitimate, the law failed, democracy failed, they stole it. What they're really saying is any time a conservative wins, that is illegitimate because it's against progress. This isn't just true in the United States. This is true in Britain as well. We'll get to that in a second. But first, I notice it's time to make a little bit more money. And I can notice that because I'm wearing my sweet movement watch that I get compliments on all the time. You know about movement. We've been talking about movement for a very long time. These guys uh, started the company, college dropouts. They've now sold almost 2 million watches worldwide by bringing quality design at fair prices. With the holiday season coming, giving gifts is easy with Movement's versatile line of watches, glasses, and accessories. So they branched out. It's not just watches anymore. They've got bracelets. They've got glasses, all really high quality. I've got a bunch of their product. I love it. I've given it away to friends too. Uh, you know, I wear my Movement watch. I get compliments on it. This one is the Atlas from the Revolver collection. They have a new collection though, which Movement, if you're listening, I really want this one or at least a little, a little discount deal on it. They have the new uh, automatic watch. So they've got quartz watches, which look great, incredible value. And then they've got a little bit more expensive, an automatic watch. So it's automatic movement. It's, it's charged by the movement of your wrist, incredible mechanical design. It's really, really excellent. That also at an affordable price. These watches, if you bought them in a department store, would be hundreds of dollars, maybe upwards of a thousand dollars. Uh, this now you can get them for 95 bucks. That's where they start. Um, and they, uh, you know, they increase in price. I think the automatic watch is just about 300 an incredible deal for that kind of technology and that kind of design. Uh, excellent, excellent product. And it's a, it's a ground up entrepreneur story. It was a crowdfunded startup. It, they've now sold a ton of watches in over 160 countries. Um, uh, unbelievable. And, and with uh, Black Friday coming up and Cyber Monday coming up, get it now because they're running great deals. You can get 25% off today during Movement's Black Friday, Cyber Monday sale. I know what you're thinking. It's not Black Friday. It's not Cyber Monday. The sale is on right now. Do it. Do not miss this opportunity. Free shipping and free returns. MVMT.com slash Covfefe. C-O-V-F-E-F-E. This is the perfect gift for Christmas, for Hanukkah, for whatever holiday that you're going to give a gift for. It's great. MVMT.com slash Covfefe, C-O-V-F-E-F-E. They launch new styles on the site all the time. Check it out and join the movement. So the left undermining democracy and ironically undermining liberalism is not just happening in the United States. It's happening in Britain as well. It's happening with the Brexit vote. Do you remember Brexit? Do you remember Brexit? It was the British exit from the European Union. They voted on this. They voted on this in June of 2016. That also was not a qu- close vote. We were told, oh, the forces of staying in the European Union, they're going to win it by a landslide. Hey, guys who want to leave the EU, don't even go vote. Don't even, you know, the polls, look at the polls. There's no way you could possibly win. Does that sound familiar? I think we've heard that in the United States before. So they go and they do the vote and the leave segment It was leave or remain. Those who want to leave the EU, those who want to remain in the EU, leave won by 52%, or rather with 52% of the vote, 52 to 48 to leave the EU. That was in June of 2016. And yet for some reason right now, Britain is still in the European Union. Why is that? The reason is 
it is very difficult to pull yourself out of these supranational, transnational, extranational organizations. This is why the United States for centuries at this point, since the very founding, since the Washington administration has been wary of entangling ourselves in supranational empires. Because once you're in them, once you give up that national sovereignty, once you give up your liberty, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to get it back. So Theresa May, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, has promised, she said, we are going to negotiate the Brexit, we're going to fulfill the promise of Brexit. What did she promise? She said, Britain would leave the single market and the regulations of the European Union. What is going to happen under her new Brexit negotiation deal? The reality is that the uh, Great Britain is going to be subject to exactly the same common rule book. They're changing the name of it, but it's exactly the same rules and regulations and single market as they're currently in with the EU. Another promise was that Britain would leave the customs union, uh, that they would be free to sign free trade deals with other countries. They can make a free trade deal with the United States. They can make a free trade deal with anybody, bilateral trade deals. The reality now with this awful Brexit deal, this fake Brexit deal from Theresa May, is that Britain will stay in the customs union. There will be no ability to negotiate free trade deals with other countries. What about the European Court of Justice? Brexit promised, Theresa May promised when she negotiated the deal, that Britain would be able to leave the European Court of Justice, this extranational, transnational judicial body that overtakes national sovereignty. In this fake Brexit deal, the uh, United Kingdom remains in the European Court of Justice on regulations, on trade, and the UK courts have to follow it. It's a big fake out. It is not Brexit. It is as though the people voted to leave the European Union and then a bunch of people on both sides of the aisle, Labor, Tory, whatever, they said, okay, we're going to follow the will of the people, and then neither side is doing it. How did this happen? If the majority of your citizens vote for something on a referendum, promised that it would take effect, why on earth would the party that promised it pull out and say, no, we're not actually going to do it? Theresa May, no, we're not actually going to do it. The first one is bureaucratic pressure bureaucrats can outlast you. They are your rulers. They've got time on their side. You don't have time on your side. If another Brexit vote were given today, would it, would it pass? Would, would the British people vote to leave the European Union? I'm not sure. A lot of left-wingers, George Soros in particular, are trying to have another referendum to undo it. They're just, this is what they do. They do it in Florida. They just keep voting and voting and voting until they get the answer that they want. But also, one, the tide of public opinion is going to change, but those bureaucrats from Brussels to the United Kingdom, those, those guys are not going to change. A few of the electeds will leave, but the, the actual government forces, the actual state is not really going to change. Now, the Tories, the conservatives in the United Kingdom, they're ostensibly the ones who are supposed to be negotiating this Brexit deal. They're supposed to be the ones on the side of leaving. But I think a lot of them secretly wanted to remain in the European Union. They say, oh, those people... Those, those country bumpkins, they just voted emotionally. They're probably clinging to their guns and religion. Oh, well, I don't think they have that many guns in Britain, but those country bumpkins shouldn't have done it. They're voting against their interest. We know better. So we're going to mollify them. We're going to pacify them and pretend that we're pulling out of the EU, but really we're going to, in effect, have exactly the same deal that we have now. And that's why you have uh, now a number of members of Theresa May's cabinet resigning because the ones who actually wanted the Brexit are saying, this is nonsense. You're trying to pull the wool over our eyes. No way. Conservatives in the U.S. do this too. They do it all the time. This is that beltway thing, that swamp thing, that Washingtonian establishment thing, is they go out and they campaign hard on conservative issues. And then what do they do when they get to office? Nothing. They never intended to do it. I've been in a lot of campaigns. I've met a lot of elected officials. And when you talk to a lot of them, the establishment type, the, uh, specifically the coastal type, the ones who have been in DC for a long time, they feel that they have much more in common with elites in journalism and politics on the other side of the aisle than they do with their own base and with their own constituents. And probably they do have more in common. Probably their, their living situation is much more similar to elites on both sides of the aisle. M probably the music they listen to, the cocktail parties that they go to, the entertainment that they digest, the books that they read are actually probably more similar among those self-appointed, benevolent, better elites than they are among their own base. So they play to their base. 
They touch down on cultural issues, on immigration, on issues that really matter to the base, which is sophisticated, by the way. These aren't just country bumpkins. I, I've talked to, I mean, I've traveled all around the country doing these speeches, and I'll talk to people in shops and Ubers on campuses, and uh, the, in the so-called country bumpkins in the flyover country uh, can articulate to me how policies affect them and affect their communities much better than anybody can in New York or L.A. When I talk to people in New York or L.A., they don't know who their congressman is. Why not? Because they're in the center of the world. They don't think in such provincial ways. They only think of grand matters like the European Union or the United Nations or national politics. But people in the so-called flyover country, they do know who their congressman is. They know who their state senator is. They know who their assemblyman is. They're much more in tune with the individual needs and demands of their communities. Uh, that's, how, that's why they know the specifics of how national and state policies affect them much better than people on the coasts. Uh, the, the other reason I think that, that Britain is trying to get away with this, that European elites are trying to get away with this, and why Americans get away with this, is because conservatives buy the left-wing cultural line, especially the elite conservatives. They buy the line. They hear that the left and the culture, they'll tell you that's impossible. Oh, it's impossible to build a wall on our southern border. Oh, it's impossible to renegotiate trade deals. Oh, it's impossible to enforce our immigration laws. It's just not possible. Look, I know we need to tell our dumb constituents that, it's, that we're going to build a wall, but we can't really build a wall. Look, we, I know we need to tell our constituents who don't know as well as us because they didn't go to Eton and e Oxford and Harvard. That we need to tell them that we're going to have the Brexit, but we can't really do it. It's not possible. Why is it not possible? If the Trump election has taught us anything, it's that we should greatly expand our imagination and the bounds of what we think is possible politically. We've gotten a lot of things done. You, just one example, they use this on the train station, or the train station, the, uh, the embassy in Jerusalem. The United States embassy in Israel is now in Jerusalem. It used to be in Tel Aviv. A lot of politicians have promised to move it to Jerusalem. And... Uh, None of them ever intended on doing it. Donald Trump actually did it. Expand your imagination. Before we get into what's going to happen in Great Britain and Europe, let's make a little money and let's talk about something very important to our liberty. Talk about expanding your imagination. Brownells, a big proponent and supporter of the Second Amendment. It has been around for 80 years. You can buy guns, ammo, accessories online. It's convenient. It's totally legal. It is the greatest online marketplace to buy firearms and firearm accessories. It is wonderful. A lot of new people these days are taking an interest in firearms. A lot, you know, sometimes I think people think that gun owners and gun enthusiasts are the, like 175-year-old old men with mustaches. That's not true. A lot of new demographics. After that shooting at Pulse nightclub, at the gay nightclub, I know a lot of uh, gay people joined the NRA, started uh, joining other gun clubs, going to the range, buying firearms. Everybody should do it. Women certainly should. Uh, there's one way for women to protect themselves physically against men, and it is to have weapons, to have firearms that evens the playing field. This is very important. It's important to protect our rights now more than ever. You have congressmen, elected officials who are saying they're going to take away your guns. They're saying it openly. They're saying the government will come for you and use the force of the state. Protect yourself. Brown Adsel is the world's leading supplier of firearms, ammunition, firearm accessories, reloading components, and more. They offer an industry-exclusive guaranteed forever warranty on all parts and accessories they have 120,000 items from new guns and ammo to nearly any gun part imaginable. It's a great organization. They've also been supporting law enforcement and charities and military charities for 80 years. Throughout the month of November, Brownells is working to help veterans in a big way. Brownells hashtag Operation 100,000 event is soliciting donations from customers. They'll match every donor dollar up to $100,000. Donations will be divided between three well-respected military charities. You've probably heard of them. Special Operations Wounded Warriors, Mission 22, Folds of Honor. You can donate by adding money to your purchase from brownells.com by visiting brownells.com slash operation 100k or donating directly. Uh, brownells.com, visit it today, pick up some gun gear, help out with a great cause, defend your rights. Other people aren't going to defend them for you. You got to make sure that you can back all that up. It's great. I love that website. So, uh, what is next for Britain? What is actually going to happen out there? Uh, possibly Theresa May is out. 
the Prime Minister of Britain may be out over this. She's already had five resignations from her cabinet. She might have two more resignations, possibly. Boris Johnson might be in. Boris Johnson, he's the politician in the UK who just looks like Donald Trump. He's probably the slightly more classically educated Donald Trump, but he's got the same hair. He's got the same affect. He's a terrific politician. And uh, he might be in. There, there's a lot of talk that he might become the next prime minister. Uh, this would be a welcome change because Britain is on the cusp of socialism, of Jeremy Corbyn, hard left style socialism. They are so close to it right now. Yeah, you could. Britain has been through a lot in its history. It faces a perilous moment. And they need to make sure that this Brexit goes through. They need to make sure that it's a real Brexit, not a fake Brexit. Uh, but who knows? I mean, this is, a, this is a real turning point. You always hear in the U.S., this is the most important election of our lifetimes. This is the most important election, blah, blah, blah. 99% of the time, it's not. This is a very important moment for the history of Britain. They're either going to careen toward insane leftism, give up their national power, or they're going to take a stand for Britain. I hope they do the latter. As someone of partially British descent, I hope that they stand for, uh, for their country and for their liberties and for the people who, who have voted and who they're supposed to be representing. We have a lot more to get to. We're going to talk about why young people are not having sex. We're going to talk about the Bolsheviks at uh, Google. And we're going to talk about Johnny Bobbitt. Not John Wayne Bobbitt. Not the one who had that unfortunate incident with John Jr. and his wife and a knife. But uh, Johnny Bobbitt, who is uh, the homeless guy who scammed all of America. But first, go to dailywire.com. If you're already there, thank you. You help keep the lights on. You keep Kofefe in my cup. If not, do you hear that? Do you hear the bells chiming, the birds singing? That's because it's almost time for our next episode of The Conversation, featuring me, little old Michael Knowles. On Tuesday, November 20th at 5.30 Eastern, 2.30 Pacific, I'll be taking all of your questions, easing your anxiety by answering you live on air. Every query that has burned in your hearts will be resolved. Best of all, it's an extra hour-long dose of, you guessed it, the guy with two thumbs and a bunch of kofefe, this one. Uh, I think it's all you could really ask for, really. Plus, Elisha Krauss will be there, too. That'll be lovely. This month's episode will stream live on Daily Wire's YouTube and Facebook pages. It's free for everyone to watch, but only subscribers can ask the questions. To ask questions as a subscriber, log into our website, dailywire.com. Go to the conversation page. Watch the stream. Start typing into the chat box. You're there. I'll answer your questions. I will, I will so vastly improve your life. Once again, subscribe to get your questions answered by me, Michael Knowles, Tuesday, November 20th, 530 Eastern, 230 Pacific, and join the conversation. I'm trying to speak in my Ben Shapiro-esque speed voice because we have so much more to get to. You'll also get the Daily Wire Tumblr if you subscribe. The Leftist Tears Tumblr, the vessel, the only one that can capture both Andrew Gillum and Bill Nelson and Stacey Abrams' tears. That's a lot. You should subscribe twice so you can get two. You don't want to have some spill and uh, radioactivity going on throughout your house. Go to dailywire.com. We'll be right back with a lot more. Who cares about the elections? Who cares about Brexit? The real problem, the great plague facing this country, young people are not having sex anymore. This is true. They're not having sex. There's an article right now in uh, The Atlantic. They refer to the sex recession that's going on in the United States. It doesn't make any sense. You would figure right now that sex would be more prevalent than you could possibly imagine. There are the dating apps. There's a study out that shows uh, 50% of people sexed they send pictures of themselves on text and leave electronic paper trails of their degeneracy like a bunch of idiots. What are you thinking? What are you people thinking? But, uh, I mean, there, Teen Vogue, Teen Vogue ran an entire feature on how to have sexual relations in places that you're not supposed to have sexual relations. They ran an ent- Teen Vogue, not regular Vogue. You know, regular Vogue, adults get a little creative sometimes, a little curious. Teen Vogue ran that, uh, that feature. And yet, nevertheless, all of this, social mores relaxed. People, there are 56 genders now, according to Facebook. So logistically, probably it should be pretty easy to find a partner to get around and bump uglies. And yet, nevertheless, New studies show that teens and young adults are having less sex than ever. Between 1991 and 2017, the percentage of high school students who have had sex dropped from 54% to 40%. Now, in some ways, I suppose in a 
if you look at it from a moral perspective or the perspective of a out of wedlock birth or abortion, that, then that's all very good. But from a cultural perspective, measuring libido and relations between the sexes, this is a little curious. Why is it that when we've got this total sex-soaked culture, you can't turn on a TV show, you can't look at a billboard without seeing near nudity, nobody's having sex anymore? I think that's part of the reason. People in their early 20s right now are two and a half times as likely to be abstinent as people in Generation X, 40s, 50s. Why is it? In part, it's, there's a decline in couplehood. So they've, they've studied this. People who would say that their couples has declined dramatically. Now, people are hooking up a little bit. There is a hookup culture. But actual boyfriend, girlfriend, if you have the flu, I'll get you chicken soup kind of couples don't, don't really exist. And as anybody who's ever been single or in a couple will tell you, when you're in a couple, you're going to have sex much more frequently. I don't care what kind of Lothario, Don Giovanni you think that you are. It just is a numbers game. It's just not going to happen as much if you don't have a regular old sweetheart. Another reason for this is that one third of parents, or rather one third of uh, adults under the age of 35 are living with their parents. This is a very sad state of affairs. I, I, I've got friends who are like this. I've actually got a number of friends who are like this. So if they're watching the show, my apologies. Don't want to uh, make you feel bad, but come on. You got, I mean, it's very difficult to maintain an active sex life if you're living with your parents at the age of 35. And it's happening around the world. It's not just happening in the United States. Uh, we, uh, you've always heard about Japan. Japan was always the example of this because they've got Broadly speaking, I don't want to make any cultural stereotypes here, but they've got some weird sexual preferences over there. You know, you see sometimes images of like squids and octopuses, and I don't remember Kurt Eichenwald got wrapped up in in octopus tentacle porn. I don't. I'm not trying to relive these images. I'm just telling you the Japanese have always had a bizarre relationship to sex, and now, according to a new study, actually a 2005 study, so it's it's not even. I think the problem has actually gotten worse since then. One third of Japanese singles between the ages of 18 and 34 were virgins. Guys, what's going on? The Japanese uh, analysts and pundits have blamed this on a term that I think we've got to bring into the United States, grass eaters. I don't remember the Japanese word for it, but they're talking about grass eaters. Herbivores is another one. They're talking about uh, soy boys. That's the, that's the term there. You know, in the U.S., especially these days, you hear terms like beta or cuck or soy boy or, or vegan or whatever. You know, there are all these terms. The Japanese have exactly the same terms. But it's, it's not just in Britain. There was a study, or in Japan, rather. There was a study a while ago in Japan that more young Japanese men would rather have uh, a night with a computer and pornography than have sex with a woman. I think it was the majority of Japanese men. That's not good. It's also true in Britain. This is also true in Australia. It's also true in Finland and the Netherlands that people are having less sex. Uh, why? I, I think there are three culprits that we can point to in the immediate aspect, which is the hookup culture and porn and Tinder, because they're all fantasies. All of them are. The hookup culture you know, the hookup culture dominates, especially college campuses these days, but even, you know, young urban professionals, people in cities, there's a hookup culture. So you're not necessarily dating someone or going steady with someone, or it's your boyfriend or girlfriend. You're hooking up. Uh, a number of people who were surveyed by this Atlantic article said they hook up because they don't have social skills. So they get blackout drunk, they go, they see a person who's reasonably attractive, and they go and hook up with them, and then maybe they call them, probably they don't call them the next day. This is a fantasy. Uh, as, as it pertains to having less sex, because when you think back on the hookup culture, all you remember are the victories. All you remember are the nights that you went home with somebody. What you don't remember are the times that you struck out, the times that you were too sloppy drunk, the times that you went home and you wish somebody would bring you soup because you've got the flu. You don't remember that. You only remember all the times that you went home with a cute chick from a bar or a party or whatever. And that's a fantasy. The same thing with porn. Porn is a fantasy. Porn is ubiquitous. It is used by virtually every guy from very young ages now. I mean, it comes in via fast internet connections. You can see anything in the world. The old joke is that if you can imagine it, there's a porn for it. I don't think that's even a joke anymore. I think Kurt Eichenwald proved to us that that's true with the weird tentacles from Japan. So a porn is this other fantasy because when you, when you get excited about pornography, it's because you're going to see 
naked chicks and weird octopuses or whatever your thing is. But the reality of pornography is that you're sitting alone in a room with a computer, pleasuring yourself. And, and I mean that both as a physical act and as a spiritual and psychological act. You're just pleasuring yourself. It's ubiquitous. I'm not judging uh, the statistical 100% of my audience, male audience that looks at porn. I'm just saying it is a fantasy. That's why it's such a temptation. That's why it's something that should be resisted. And the other fantasy is Tinder. Tinder and all of the dating apps where you swipe right, swipe left is a fantasy because while I know people who have gotten married off of Tinder, I've been to weddings where people get married off of Tinder, the majority of time spent on Tinder is not time meeting people, hooking up, finding a wife. The majority of time on Tinder is just wasted time. Swipe, swipe, a couple messages, swipe, 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 swipe. So you think you've got access to all of the women of the world at your fingertips, but in reality, it's just an illusion. It's a mirage. Swipe, swipe, swipe. And a lot of people have written into the show and they say they don't even get people to write back. It's just taking up all of their time. So that's a, a culprit. Another culprit is feminism. I, I know it's easy to blame feminism for everything, so I will do that. But feminism is a major problem here because feminism is trying to take all of the love and the care and the complementarity of the sexes out of relationships. The great example of this is as we approach Christmas season is baby it's cold outside. You know, for the last few years, feminists have waged war on baby it's cold outside because they say it's a, it's a rapey song. It promotes rape, which is insane. The lyrics of baby it's cold outside are, I really can't stay, baby it's cold outside. I've got to go away, baby it's cold outside. This evening has been so very nice. I'll hold your hands there just like ice. And what the feminists hear is a woman who's saying, I want to leave, and a man who's saying, you should stay, and that makes him a rapist. He's a rapist. How He's not listening to her no. What they misunderstand is seduction, coyness, modesty, the virtue of modesty, which has been erased from feminist culture. The woman who's saying, I really shouldn't stay, is not saying, I'm in an alleyway. Help me, help me. I want to get out of here. She's with this guy that she likes. She's before the fire. They're having a couple drinks. She wants to stay. What The reason she's resisting is because of the virtue of modesty. She doesn't want to lose her reputation. She doesn't want to seem too easy. She doesn't want to seem like she's giving in. And then he is trying to seduce her and persuade her to stick around. The other line they mention about baby it's cold outside is uh, uh, she's, uh, they say, she asks, say, what's in this drink? And the guy says, no cabs to be had out there. This is a joke from the 30s and 40s when, again, in response to the virtue of modesty, you want to do something that you're not really supposed to do, then you could blame it on having too much to drink or there's a roofie in your drink or whatever. You're trying to give away responsibility for the act that you want to do. But even broadly, even taking these exaggerations out, the song is about a man who wants a woman and a woman who clearly wants the man too, but is trying to resist. And that is the game because traditionally romantic relations between the sexes involve male assertiveness and then women ultimately deciding if they're going to stay or not, if they're going to give in to the guy or not. Women have totally eradicated this. Now everything has to be consensual. There's no difference between men and women. It's, it's all about consensual contracts. Of course, baby it's cold outside is about consent too. It's about a man trying to persuade the woman to give it, give away the virtue of modesty for a night and have a little indiscretion and they can enjoy each other. That is consent too, but it's not clinical consent. It's not signing a piece of paper and saying, we're going to do this and then we're going to do this and then we're going to do this. Uh, For feminists, they've wiped all of this out and it's made relations between the sexes pretty hard. Is a man allowed to seduce a woman anymore? Is a woman allowed to pay lip service to the virtue of modesty anymore? What, what are dates looking like? What, do, what does the relationship between the sexes look like when feminists deny that there's any difference at all? I think that's a big a part of it. But either way, I feel sorry for you young people that, <laughs> that you're all so uh, terribly, I think, involuntarily abstinent at the moment and you're just giving in to porn and selfishness. That's not great. Uh, it's very fun. Women are great. It's great to spend time with women. It's great to be respectful, and it's great to be a man, and it's great to be a woman. And uh, the more our culture is confused about what all those things are, uh, the less you're going to see men and women interacting in, in any sort of capacity. Johnny Bobbitt, i got to talk about this. I, this is something I'm very grateful for uh, as we approach Thanksgiving. Johnny Bobbitt is this homeless guy. He's a bum. You might remember him because about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, November 2017, 
this woman, Kate McClure, 28 years old, uh, and her boyfriend, Mark D'Amico, who was a bit older, uh, they had this story where they said Kate ran out of gas on I-95 and it was in November and she was so cold and she couldn't figure out what to do. And Johnny Bobbitt Jr., a, a wonderful homeless man with a heart of gold, took the last $20 out of his pocket and gave it to her so that she could fill up her gas tank. This is so heartwarming. The media loved this story. Here's, here's Good Morning America talking about it. Just remind yourself of this heartwarming story. So you're not wearing the glasses because you're Hollywood now. No, man. I've got an eye infection in my right eye. But it's Johnny Bobbitt Jr.'s face and story that's gone viral, with thousands giving to the Good Samaritan after an honorable deed two months ago. I was driving down 95 and <laughs> ran out of gas. So I pulled over on, to the side of the road. He walked up and he said, get back in the car, uh, lock the doors, you know. I'll be back. Kate McClure says she could tell the man walking up to her off the highway was homeless. Got her gas to help her get back on her way. Wasn't expecting anything in return. Me and my boyfriend Mark went back the next day. He Five gave seconds. him $100. I was ecstatic. That gesture of helping stranded motorists is something Johnny has done countless times. How often would you go to see Johnny? A few times a week. Unknowingly, he was about to get hit with karma. What if we started to go fund me for this guy? We set it up in the car on the way home. They started to go fund me. They raised four hundred thousand dollars. Isn't that for Johnny, who helped her out, gave her his last twenty bucks? He's always helping motorists because Johnny's such a good guy. And they, this couple, they just decided out of the goodness of their heart to help him. And that's so wonderful. The trouble with the story is it's completely fake. It is completely fake news. Whenever somebody tells you that the news media don't run fake news, point them to this story because it wasn't just ABC. Everybody ate this story up, ran with it. It's a total hoax. Uh, Johnny never gave her 20 bucks to fill up her gas tank. She didn't run out of gas on I-95. Uh, they, they didn't end up giving Johnny a lot of this money. This was all a scam perpetrated by Kate McClure and her boyfriend, Mark D'Amico. And they found this homeless guy, Johnny, that is true. They found, they found this dude and they used him and they offered to give him a portion of the money and they played on people's heartstrings and they raised $400,000. It all started to unravel when Johnny Bobbitt sued the couple because they weren't giving him enough of the money and they were spending money on vacations. They were spending money on BMWs and Mercedes. I mean, really nice cars. And so eventually he sued and then this thing started to unravel. What does this tell us? What are the lessons as we approach Thanksgiving? First of all, the press doesn't do its job. The press doesn't investigate these things. The, the media should have investigated this before they ran this story from coast to coast. And they didn't do it because they're weak journalists and they're not living up to their profession. Okay. Also, the American people aren't doing their job. Do-gooders aren't doing their job. They should look into this. Every time somebody puts their hand out, and says, give me some money. It's good to give charity. I love giving charity. I think everybody should give charity. But you got to make sure that you're not empowering scam artists. And uh, this also teaches us a, a, an important lesson about virtues. Because I got this question when I was on the road. It, this was from a girl who said, I'm a Christian. And I really want to know how to approach immigration and illegal immigration because my compassion tells me we should take in everybody, anybody who wants to come in, anybody who's here illegally, we should just take them in. How am I wrong? Shouldn't a Christian do that? And you say, yes, a Christian should be merciful and compassionate and charitable. But a, a Christian should also be prudent. A Christian should also not create perverse incentives that hurt people who cross the border illegally or that hurt the country and make it less capable of giving charity in the future. There are many virtues. There are seven virtues, faith, hope, and charity, and another four virtues, fortitude, justice, prudence, and temperance. And prudence is the important one here. You shouldn't be imprudent. You should, you should use your knowledge. You should use your rational faculties and your wisdom to seek out uh, what the truth of a situation is. Because uh, I think Chester, Chesterton talked about this, how when you just take one virtue and you promote that virtue to the exclusion of all of the other virtues, you can actually make it more closely resemble a vice than a virtue. If you have only mercy without any justice, uh, that it, that's not a virtue. That's not a great virtue. If you have only justice without any mercy, how can you have true justice in a world of fallen men? And when you just give your money away, I know we're too rich as a country. We just want to give it away. We feel like we're not good people. 
we don't go to church anymore. We don't go to, we don't participate in traditional charity. We don't uh, participate in our communities. So when it, when we see a GoFundMe and a heartstring story, we just want to donate money to it. But you've got to use your prudence as well. And you, you can't choose one virtue and exclude all of the others. So while we're uh, giving Thanksgiving, well, we're so happy for all the blessings that we have. Well, we want to extend those blessings to other people. You've got to use your head. You don't want to make a situation worse. You don't want to empower bad people and bad actors. You want to use the resources that you have wisely. This is a lesson that we can take personally and nationally. We've got a lot more to get to, but we're out of time. Too bad. We'll get to it tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. I'll see you tomorrow. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Senia Villarreal. Executive producer, Jeremy Borey. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer, Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Edited by Jim Nickel. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.